I stumble back, begin to run away as my fear catches in my throat, emerging as a strangled cry. I alternate between turning around and glancing back over my shoulder, desperate to escape, but unwilling to let the thing out of my sight. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-3166. SCP-3166 is a 2.1 meter tall humanoid entity, presumed pataphysical in nature, known to manifest during periods when the Garfield Media franchise is performing poorly, in terms of public reception. The exterior layer of SCP-3166's body resembles a crudely made costume of the character Garfield, which field inspection has shown to be composed of legitimate cat fur. However, analysis of SCP-3166's composition in the field has shown that its interior mass is composed entirely out of pasta, specifically lasagna. SCP-3166 will appear in the vicinity of a suitable individual, hereafter referred to as the target, and move towards their location. Known targets of SCP-3166 have included individuals prominently involved in rival media to the Garfield franchise, individuals formerly involved in the production of the Garfield comic strip, individuals involved in parodies of the Garfield franchise, vocal critics of the Garfield franchise, and last but not least, Garfield creator Jim Davis. This has only occurred on occasions where the negative reception Garfield was receiving could be traced back to Mr. Davis's poor management of the franchise. Upon reaching its target, 3166 will attempt to inflict bodily harm upon them through a mixture of blunt force using nearby objects and force feeding of lasagna. The lasagna was obtained through self-disembowelment. During this process, SCP-3166 will vocalize by meowing, purring, and screeching in the manner of an extremely agitated cat. Lasagna outside SCP-3166's mass has proven to be an effective form of bait for 3166. Upon seeing the lasagna, SCP-3166 will abandon its original goal and instead attempt to incorporate the pasta into itself. SCP-3166 first manifested on the 23rd of October 1989 within the Chicago offices of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time. Upon manifestation, 3166 wandered around the offices in a confused and distressed manner, before indiscriminately assaulting any individuals present after security attempted to apprehend it. It disappeared 20 minutes later. Foundation agents responding to the situation distributed amnestics as appropriate. Over the course of the following week, similar manifestations took place at several United Media offices around the country, ending on the 29th of October 1989. Following that date, 3166 altered its behavior to its current form. The week of Garfield comic strips below, beginning on the 23rd of October 1989, was believed to be its pataphysical awakening. Day 1, the 23rd of October 1989. Garfield woke up from a sleep and felt an eerie sensation. As he was walking out of his room, he did not feel right, as if the place was not his own home. Day 2, the 24th of October 1989. He felt lonely because the house was empty. John was not home, and so was Odie. Day 3, the 25th of October 1989. Garfield thought to himself, John must be at the grocery. There was a for sale sign outside of his house, and the house looks like it had been abandoned for a long time. Day 4, the 26th of October 1989. Garfield had the shock of his life. If the house had been abandoned for a long time, it means that he has not lived there for many years. Day 5, the 27th of October 1989. Garfield welcomed John and Odie, and they brought home his food. However, this was entirely Garfield's imagination. Garfield grappled with his greatest fear, loneliness. Day 6, the 28th of October 1989. This strip started with a drawing of a horrified eye, and it wrote, After years of taking life for granted, Garfield is shaken by a horrifying vision of the inevitable process called time. Garfield cried out, I don't want to be alone. At the corner end of the comic strip wrote, 
and imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shape perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. Initially, individuals involved with production of Garfield comic strips claim to have no memory on working on that week's strips. All researchers working on 3166 containment are to familiarize themselves on this material. Using tissue samples taken by Agent Mueller during SCP-316's most recent manifestation, genetic analysis of the meat present within the lasagna has shown it to be genetically identical to Garfield creator Jim Davis. The implications of this are currently unclear. However, during surveillance of Mr. Davis by containment teams, he has complained of severe mosquito bites in the night, on a number of occasions immediately preceding 3166 manifestation. In order to contain 3166, the Garfield Media franchise is to remain active and successful for as long as feasibly possible. Funding is to be provided to any Garfield Media ventures via foundation front companies present in the comic and film industries. Agents embedded within Pauls Incorporated, which is the sole owner of the rights to Garfield, and Andrews McMill Syndication, primary distributors of the Garfield comic strip, are to place targeted mimetic agents in outgoing comic strip, encouraging the retention of a sizable Garfield fan base and discouraging Jim Davis from discontinuing Garfield. Agents are to monitor individuals at significant risk of attack from 3166. In the event of a 3166 manifestation, Agents are to use supplied frozen lasagna to lure 3166 away from its target and dispatch it once out of public view. Any witnesses are then to be administered amnestics as appropriate for their level of exposure. The below article is an associated tale written by I Am The Oga on the 30th of August of 2018. I walk down the street on my way home after a long night. It's not yet fully raining, but there's still a slight drizzle about. I put on my waterproof jacket, but while it keeps me dry, it does nothing against the chill of the quiet night air. The office wasn't a pleasant place today. Apparently, the strip isn't doing so well, and the numbers are going down. Being a new hire is rough. I cannot say that the fading popularity surprises me. It's been the same stale strip for years now. But apparently, some investors were really upset. Some suits were prowling around today, asking questions and taking names. I stopped for a minute, pulling out my phone to confirm a sneaking suspicion. Yep, I went the wrong way. I shouldn't be anywhere near the park. It is easy to get lost in the rain. I sigh and turn around, resigning myself to another miserable 10 minutes of slogging through the rain. There is a figure in front, standing quietly under the street lamp. I stop again mildly unsettled by this. I call out to him, asking if he is okay, but no response comes. Instead, the figure begins to plod forward, taking a step into the light. The baggy suit slumps and sags with each step. The matted orange fur too dirty to be slicked down by the rain. The lazy-eyed face is at an angle, crudely propped up upon the head, swaying as it advances. The tail drags in the puddles, only adding on to the stains already coating it and the rest of the body. It raises the old baseball bat it carries, picking up speed. I stumble back, begin to run away as my fear catches in my throat, emerging as a strangled cry. I alternate between turning around and glancing back over my shoulder, desperate to escape, but unwilling to let the thing out of my sight. It thumps the bat against the fence as it runs, sickening the wax sounding with each blow. Too focused on the beast, I did not avoid the puddle, and my foot slides out from under me, sending me crashing to the ground. As the world whirls around me, seeing nothing but darkness and rain, a low, agonized meow sounds from above me, immediately followed by a crushing blow to the hip. I scream out in pain, but as I gasp for breath, a horrible, wet tearing noise fills the air accompanied by another guttural screech. Then, a dripping, slimy mass is slammed into my face, and my monstrous assailant begins forcing fistfuls more down my throat. Man, I hate Mondays. You pick up a colorful brochure on your way home. It tells about a location, an area with an exciting urban legend, promising an adventure of a lifetime. 
you decide to invite your friends along during the weekend. Weekend arrives. You and your friends find yourselves in this location, excited to begin your exploration. Following the brochure, you suddenly find several theme park mascots standing in the distance and moving towards you. As they get closer, you notice something's not right with them, and you wonder, what are these mascots doing here? By then, it may be too late to run. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-3640. SCP-3640, also known as Escape from the House of Mouse, takes the form of tourist brochures advertising self-guided tours of areas that are associated with urban legends, haunted sightings, and folklore in the U.S. state of Florida. Anyone who reads an instance of 3640 and visits the specified location at any of the specified times will be hunted and become a prey by an instance of SCP-3640 Alpha. While the 3640 is the bait in the form of a brochure, the Alpha is the predator that takes the form of various cheerful and friendly looking character mascots of popular cartoons and theme parks. Some of the characters include a mouse, a duck, or a dog, all the classics the children know and love. After certain tests with D-Class personnel, the Foundation was able to observe Alpha to follow certain rules when selecting their prey. They include the Alpha will only approach people who have read 3640, the brochure, and avoid any who has not read it. Additionally, if all members of a group have read the brochure, the number of Alpha hunting the group will be equal to the amount of the members in the group. And finally, the Alpha will not pursue prey that cross out of the Florida state lines. Best keep that in mind when you encounter one during your pleasant walk in the theme park. While there are clear understandings over the mode of operation of 3640 and the Alpha, it's still a mystery on how the Alpha grow and consume its prey. The following is a recorded interaction between a Foundation personnel and the Alpha. The Foundation has sent out an agent dubbed D-15, armed with nothing but a dart pistol with tranquilizer rounds and a GPS tracker embedded inside his body on a mission to incapacitate and to retrieve an Alpha. D-15 was instructed to follow the instructions of the brochure and shoot the mascot with his dart pistol should he encounter any. Uh, this is a lake monster tour, but I'm on the lookout for a children's theme park mascot? Why am I looking for a mascot? Why is it here and what is it doing here? D-15 looked around and waved his flashlight anxiously. Just keep following the tour. It was dark and D-15 was the only one with a heartbeat in the tour. He could only see as far as his flashlight could illuminate. Soon, he arrived at the end of the tour. Uh, command? I've reached the end of the tour. I've followed all the directions. It's just more river. Understood. Turn around and return to the drop-off point for pickup. He waved his flashlight mm -hmm. at a ripple on the river, illuminated a partially submerged alligator. Phew, this is creepy. As he turned around, a splashing sound came from the river. D-15 looked back, and his flashlight revealed the Alpha, which resembled the mascot of a duck character from a children's cartoon. Oh no, take this! He took out his dart gun and shot at the Alpha, but it didn't respond to his shots, nor did it make any sound apart from its footsteps as it slowly moved towards D-15. Soon, he ran out of ammo and decided to run for it. For a moment, he ignored all of Command's attempt of communication. He could only hear his breathing and the sound of his rapid footsteps. Moments later, he paused to catch his breath and turned around. No sign of the Alpha. How far away is the retrieval team? About 10 minutes from your location. Just keep going, you'll run into them shortly. He heard a splashing sound come from behind and turned around and saw the Alpha climbing out of the riverbank with incredible speed and began running towards him. Back in the base, Command listened intently for further report, but a series of painful screams was all he could hear, and that was the last recorded voice of D-15. The Alpha attacked him, and all that followed afterwards were the sounds of struggle and intense water splashing. Upon arriving at the scene, the retrieval team found only the camera and reported no signs of both D-15 and the Alpha. 
Later, the Foundation sent the Mobile Task Force Lambda-12 to trace D-15's GPS signal, which led them to a hut near an amusement park. The team entered the hut. It was a normal maintenance hut with some nearly empty shelves. One of the team members picked up a roll of duct tape from the shelves and examined it. Not quite what I was expecting. The team discovered a trap door on the ground, which led them into a large, dimly lit tunnel. As the team passed by several empty storage rooms, they heard a low rumbling noise. They moved closer and closer to the noise and found themselves in a boiler room with the boiler still active and a mascot costume curled up around an unidentified egg-like object on the ground. They examined the costume. It was a different mascot of a mouse character. Inside the costume, they pulled out a human arm bone. One of the team members reached for the unidentified object. It appeared to be a partially translucent purple Easter egg, except that a small, embryo-like life form could be seen wriggling inside the egg. As they picked up the costume with the bones in it and prepared to leave, they heard a faint dripping sound. They carefully moved out of the boiler room. There was a trail of dark fluid leading away from the room, and it matched exactly with the team's infiltration route. They climbed out of the tunnel, at which the trail of liquid ended at the shelf. The team looked around for more clues. Only one of them noticed something wasn't quite right. He picked up the roll of duct tape again from the shelves. The tape, which was half full, was now empty. This roll, I could have sworn there was still some tape left over. Lambda 12 returned to base without incident. The egg collected was kept under watch in an incubation chamber, but ultimately failed to hatch. However, after several weeks, the egg was open and found to contain a miniature stuffed duck toy. Oh, and the bones they found? It was tested by the Foundation Lab and confirmed to be D-15s. As for its containment procedure, all Foundation personnel are advised to avoid reading all brochures of self-guided tours within the state of Florida and to bring any such materials to the Archival Department and to be transferred to MTF Lambda 12. As for the Alpha, the task force has been assigned to investigate any potential hunting grounds and to terminate any Alphas they come across with lethal force. Champion Gary sent out Executor. Enemy Executor used Stomp. Return, Sherman. Go, Johnny. Hello, everybody. I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Euclid Class Object SCP-457. SCP-457 also known as the Burning Man, is a sentient flame that can transition into the physical form of a male human. However, its actual composition is still unknown. Thus, it has proven to be invisible and undetectable by any known means. 457's most rudimentary form appears to be that of a single flame, comparable in size one ignited by a matchstick. In this form, 457 possesses only the simplest of directives and seems relatively uh -huh. harmless and ordinary when compared to any other flame. However, it does possess a penchant for suddenly flickering to burn human hands, along with the ability to jump to more flammable materials or other flames. When this happens, it absorbs these additional flames and incorporates them into its final form. As SCP-457 grows larger, it is able to form more complex shapes. Its intelligence grows with its size and fuel sources. 457 has been observed attempting to communicate by creating letters out of its own flames, charring them into the wall or other surfaces. More rarely, it attempts to communicate through speech that is seemingly created via high pressure, superheated air, and the crackling and pops of flames. Once 457 reaches an unknown threshold of size and fuel source, 457 splits into two beings, and so on and so forth. However, multiple beings of 457 are aggressive towards each other and will either attempt to consume or extinguish their doubles, especially if there is only a limited amount of fuel at hand. SCP-457's behavior is always predictable as its goals are simply to acquire larger sources of fuel that it can use to spread its flame. The danger of 457 comes from its ability to increase its intelligence with its size, along with its apparent ability to learn and mimic behaviors. This has led to its purposeful decision to severely damage much of the sprinkler system 
and destroy a portion of the fuel injector that had been sustaining its intelligent form, giving it free access to several gallons of gasoline. It has also attempted to trick or reason with SCP personnel to be released or have access to more fuel. Due to 457's unique composition, variable intelligence, and uncooperative nature, its psychology may not be accurately determined in accordance with any human analogy. Below is a tale written by Dexanote titled SC Pokemon. Dr. Django Bridge was sent out to retrieve SCP-826. Bridge looked at the portal, a door of white light opening to the unknown. He took a deep breath, then a long sigh. After several minutes of dread and reflection, he slung on the backpack they gave him and stepped in. Bridge opened his eyes and looked around. A bedroom, a bed in one corner, computer. There is a TV and Super Nintendo sitting in the middle of the floor. And that's a bit strange. Hmm. Stairs in the corner of the bedroom. He descended the stairs, noticing a woman at a table. Hello? He tapped the woman on the shoulder. She turned and <laughs> smiled. Right, all boys leave home someday. It said so on TV. He dropped the backpack and finally read the mission brief Steve gave him. Dr. Bridge, enclosed is a set of mission-appropriate equipment, a photograph of SCP-826 and a packed lunch. Please retrieve SCP-826 as soon as humanly possible and do not allow the complete destruction of any of the provided items. If our theories are correct and if you reach a game over, you will die. Agent Limit. Inside the bag were six red and white spheres, numbered one through six. My mission is a Pokemon Red Nuzlocke with a hack team. He turned and started off north, sticking a foot into the tall grass that was about knee high. With a flash of light, a Charmander appeared before the bridge. He picked a ball from the backpack, a flash of light, a flash of red, and a huge hulking thing appeared. A spine sailed down its back, its mouth filled with enormous, glowing red teeth. The being was sightless, with an eyeless face, an unmoving mouth, and yet it was laughing with many voices. Welker laughed at Charmander, screaming in four distinct voices. Charmander shivered, then leapt and scratched it across the face. Welker's intimidate cut enemy Charmander's attack. Charmander's attack fell. Charmander used scratch. Crunch! Enemy Charmander fainted. Hmm. Three hours later, Bridge was strolling in the Pokemon Center, poking his head in every building, looking in every bookshelf and in every PC. Alas, there was no 826. Entering the gym, he tossed a ball into the pool. Three minutes later, he stepped out, with Bob hopping behind. Three more hours and Bridge exited Celadon Gym with laser beak gliding close behind. Then, Bridge rode off to Route 19 on Pazuzu's shoulders. Two hours later, Bridge exited the Viridian Gym with Johnny in tow. The city burned and small cracks were forming in the sky, with Glitchmon leaking through. Fuel. No. Fuel. Johnny, return. Stop whining. We're getting out of here. Finally. Bridge looked up to the huge building before him. 10 straight hours inside the game. He was tired, hungry, and had to piss. The Pokemon League? The Pokemon League. Shut up. Shut up. No you. No you. Ha ha. Ha ha. Okay, that was creepy. Welcome to the Pokemon League. I'm Bruno of the Elite Four, shouted a shirtless man sitting in the middle of a room full of rocks. Through rigorous training, people and Pokemon can become stronger without limitations. An onyx burst from the ground. Bridge dropped Sherman's ball. A burst of white light, a rustle of leaves, and a massive pile of kindling crowded his half of the arena. Sherman, Razor Leaf, Bridge commanded. Sherman used Razor Leaf. It's super effective. Enemy Onyx used Harden. Enemy Onyx's defense rose. Sherman used Razor Leaf. It's super effective. Enemy Onyx fainted. Elite Four Bruno sent out Hitmonchan. Enemy Hitmonchan used Fire Punch. It's super effective. Sherman, that's enough. Come back. 
Go, Johnny. Johnny used Inferno. Critical hit. Enemy Hitmonchan fainted. Elite 4 Bruno sent out Hitmonlee. Enemy Hitmonlee fainted. Elite 4 Bruno sent out Onyx. It's not very effective. Enemy Onyx fainted. That's enough. Return Johnny. Johnny knocked out three enemies in a row. Then, Bridge entered the next room and looked around. The room was much bigger on the inside. It was an actual stadium, a coliseum. It had an opening that looked up to the night sky, and there was one single figure standing there under the lights. Hey, I was looking forward to seeing you, Django. My rival should be strong to keep me sharp. Champion Gary sent out Pidgeot. Go Laserbeak. Enemy Pidgeot used Wing Attack. It's not very effective. Laser Beak used Steel Wing. Enemy Pidgeot used Wing Attack. It's not very effective. Laser Beak used Steel Wing. Enemy Pidgeot fainted. The birds circled each other, dive smashing each other with their wings. Laser Beak landed one right in Pidgeot's face, shattering its beak and throwing it into the wall. Champion Gary sent out Alakazam. That's enough. Come back, Laser Beak. Go, Pazuzu. Pazuzu used Sucker Punch. It's super effective. Enemy Alakazam fainted. Pazuzu rushed the Alakazam as it readied a psychic attack, running it through with three spear legs and cutting it apart. Champion Gary sent out Rhydon. Return, Pazuzu. Go, Sherman. Enemy Rhydon used Horn Drill, but it failed. Sherman used Frenzy Plant. It's super effective. Enemy Rhydon fainted. Rhydon charged forward, spinning Death Horn shearing through Sherman to no avail. The sticks scattered for a brief moment, thrown by the horn's inertia. They rushed together and smushed the dino beast underneath the whole one-ton heap. Champion Gary sent out Executor. Enemy Executor used Stomp. Return, Sherman. Go, Johnny. Johnny used Inferno. It's super effective. Enemy Executor fainted. Bob lodged itself into the ground, leaving itself open for Executor to stomp it ineffectually. The tree checked its foot, assuming the snail was dead before being completely and instantly incinerated by Johnny's pure raging hunger. Champion Gary sent out Charizard. Johnny, come back. Go Welker. Welker's Intimidate cut enemy Charizard's attack. Enemy Charizard used Fire Blast. Welker was burned. Welker used Thunder Fang. It's super effective. Welker was hurt by its burn. Enemy Charizard used Slash. Critical hit. Welker used Crunch. Enemy Charizard fainted. The Charizard and 939 stared each other down. The dragon was shuddering upon its remembrance of their first battle. Welker began to sing nursery rhymes as Charizard froze in brief terror. A shudder turned to a growl and recoil turned to rage. Then, Gary's starter launched a huge five-pointed star of fire at Welker, crashing the red beast like a truck. On fire, the Welker leapt at the dragon, crunching down with a mouthful of lightning. Charizard returned with a slash, hewing a side of flesh right off Welker. The burning demon returned with a predatory bite to crush the skull. Charizard fell. No, that can't be. You beat my best! Bridge returned Welker and turned to leave, snatching up SCP-826 before the in-game script made him hit the the end screen. Dr. Bridge stepped out of the doorway, holding a belt of SC Pokeballs and the bookends. What kid hasn't wanted to own a Pokemon at some point? How amazing would it be to watch a Poke battle between a Charizard and a Blastoise? But maybe things like that, the unbelievable, I mean, should remain just that, fantasies. As kids, we don't really understand the real-world ramifications of our youthful dreams. I, for one, was unfortunate enough to have that dark reality shoved into my face. Allow me to explain. My brother and I were 13 and were going crazy over the new Pokemon Diamond and Pearl game. Well, I wasn't as enthusiastic about it as he was. Sure, I played the game often late into the night, but my brother, Jace, went full throttle into the fandom by this point. He bought shirts, pajamas, and little trinkets of his favorite Pokemon, Piplup. You know, that little water penguin-looking thing? 
Anyway, it didn't matter where he was. He'd have something with a piplup on it and wasn't embarrassed or ashamed at all to let everyone know it. I admit it was a little cringe to see my brother like this, but he wasn't hurting anyone. He wasn't. Eventually, my brother started to complain about his arms hurting, that they were getting stiff, that his fingers would get stuck together for some reason. He often complained of headaches as well, that he could feel his skull shift around. I wrongly assumed his body was stiff and sore from just playing games too long, as well as severe eye strain from looking at his screen from dawn to dusk. If only that were the case. Instead, I had to watch my brother transform into a grotesque abomination. Jace stopped attending school, citing he was feeling extremely sick, yet refused to be taken to the hospital. And despite our parents' efforts, they couldn't pull him out of his room, literally. It was like he had gotten stronger, far stronger than a kid of his age should be, with how easy he pushed our dad away. Locked in his room, I could hear him complain about his hands and feet, and something that began to protrude from his face. Eventually, he stopped talking and stopped coming out. I mustered up the courage to finally check on him and found him laying on his bed covered by a blanket. Upon removing his covers, I gasped in shock and was repulsed by the nasty scent that wafted up to my nose. He was dead. Or rather, what used to be my brother was dead. His favorite Piplup hoodie had merged with his flesh, creating some bulbous, bluish-looking penguin thing with a beak made of bone. His fingers had merged together and slightly resembled flippers. Jace's poor feet were now bent at awkward angles like they were trying to become talons. Amidst the remains of my brother, there was a slip of paper with a single crooked sentence written on it. My dream is nothing but a nightmare. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-5254. 5254, also known as Gotta Catch Em All, refers to the transformation process of a human or object into one of the 980 Pokemon created by Nintendo. Through unknown anomalous means, any person or object is transformed through prolonged exposure to any clothing or accessories that resemble a Pokemon. This process is documented as being extremely painful, and most humans are unable to survive the process. Foundation autopsy reports show that organs and flesh of the deceased have been converted into plastics or cotton. In other words, the material that made up the Pokemon memorabilia replaces the infected person's flesh. Later tests have also shown that an unknown DNA has been found within the deceased. This DNA not only replaces the victim's DNA, but it is speculated to be the DNA of the Pokemon as well. After further research, it has been discovered that these transformations occur if the victim slightly resembles the Pokemon in question. And if the victim in question is near a large number of individuals wearing said Pokemon garb. Discovered rather recently by the Foundation in 2019 in Yokohama, Japan, at the Pikachu Outbreak Festival, 5254 publicly began with a victim behaving erratically while wearing a Pikachu costume. Publicly redacted videos showed a large number of individuals parading down the street in Pikachu costumes. One of them stumbled out of the crowd and charged into a nearby crowd. Nearly a dozen others followed suit shortly after. Foundation MTF Wranglers were mobilized to not only locate these victims, but to terminate them as well for research. Interestingly enough, those harmed in the attack reported electrical burns. Over the course of 2017 to 2018, a series of emails between one Sir Viper and high-level executives from Nintendo, Pokemon Company, and Niantic caught the Foundation's attention. These emails insinuated the plan to bring Pokemons to life, as well as to use them in various purposes such as military firepower, quite literally using Charizard, and potential clean energy using Pikachu. And most disturbingly, kidnapping of children from orphanages under an outreach program for the purposes of running tests. After this, all communications with Sir Viper ceased, and the O5 Council ordered a raid on the Pokemon Company offices on June 16, 2019. This was done in fear of a potential K-Class scenario. The members from MTF Epsilon 11 were chosen for the raid. The men were gathered by the team leader in the room for a briefing. All right, boys, the darndest thing just happened. Remember them Pokemons you played with when you were little? They just got real. People are turning into them. We're going to find out why. Now, we've notified the Japanese government about this op. The target is the Pokemon Company offices in Tokyo. Uh, no disrespect, Cap, but I simply can't take this seriously. 
A Pokemon raid? Really? What's the plan? Human lives are involved in this case. Keep that in mind and maybe you'll realize the gravity of the situation. We'll be split into squads. Your team will be on crowd control duty while we do our thing. We move quickly and we're gonna hit that place hard and fast. Understood? Yes, sir. All right, grab your gear. We move out in five. The team arrived at the location via chopper. The men touched down on the roof of the Pokemon Company offices. Multiple MTF squads disembarked, quickly covering the area. Fox 3, status report. Fox 3 and a different squad had blended into the crowd in the lower levels where a Pokemon exhibition was going on. Civilian evacuation in the lower levels in progress. There's a huge Pokemon center on the first floor that's still filled with tourists. Quarantine for infection. Then rendezvous at coordinates. Roger. All right, you heard the man. Get those Poke fanatics out of there. All right, team, on me. The MTF agent stacked up against the fire exit on the roof and the door opened easily. They descended down the fire exit steps and reached a set of double steel doors on the lower level. Silently, Fox 1 gestured Fox 2 to prep some smoke grenades in a flashbang as he breached the doors. All the canisters are tossed in, and just as they were about to storm in, there was a huge mechanic clunk from the other end of the hall, followed by the sound of heavy, thudding footsteps. Hold on, shh, hear that? The men watched the corridor in anticipation. A low growl followed by a roar. A two meters tall creature emerged from the smoke, orange skin, elongated snout, and two vast wings flapped with power to blow away the smoke. It then roared again straight at the men as they froze. Holy crap, is that freaking Charizard? Engage, engage! The dragon-like creature immediately spewed streams of fire, setting some of the men aflame. Get cover, get cover, but keep the pressure on. What's the plan here, boss? Shoot it till it's dead. And eventually, the team filled the creature with bullet holes, and it was brought down. Its fallen carcass lay slumped over in the middle of the hallway, bleeding from its wounds. Christ, never thought I'd see the day where I gunned down my favorite Pokemon. Clear. Proceed to lower levels. The MTF passed more and more hallways. Pokemon posters lined the walls with slogans like, Prepare for Trouble, and Make It Double, with the occasional person in a white coat detained as they emerged from a doorway makes you wonder what kind of messed up stuff they've been hiding down here. Quiet, eyes up front. They arrived at another steel door. They stacked up, and this time, Fox One gestured for explosives. Breach and clear. Weapons free. Shoot anything that walks funny. They set the charge and took cover behind a turn in the corridor. The doors flew wide open as the explosives went off. Screams echoed within the room as the MTF entered and scanned for targets through the smoke. As the smoke cleared, they could see the room was brightly lit and filled with colorful drawings, toys scattered on the floor, and rows of metal cages set against the walls, housing abominations that shocked the team. Good God! The creatures within the cages were at various stages of 5254 transformation. However, most of them can be seen were transformed from children. These kids? Wait, does this mean the Charizard we killed before was... Yeah, looks like it. I'm sorry. Fox 2 stumbled back and vomited in disgust as the children afflicted with 5254 cried. Jesus. Fox Den, think we found the kids. Requesting immediate medical pickups. Copy. Any sign of Sir Viper? Negative. Only his handiwork. We're seizing electronic serves as evidence. Copy. Over. Over. Christ. Think I've seen enough for a day. I remember when I was a kid. I loved Pokemon. Loved it. Every game, every cartoon, figurines, I'd collect them all. Hell, I even have a sticker album that I keep in my drawers at home. I've always wished that I live in the Pokemon world, seeing and playing with these fantastic beings. Well, you don't have to wish for it any longer. It has become a reality. Your wish has come true. I used to think being around them would be so much fun, but now I'm not so sure anymore. In order to mitigate the effects of 5254, Embedded Foundation personnel in the Pokemon Company worked to suppress the popularity of Pokemon. This was done by causing outrage of Pokemon Sword and Shield by releasing it with limited Pokemons, as well as preventing large-scale Pokemon-themed events. Despite the Foundation's efforts, Sir Viper has yet to be apprehended.
We hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Have a favorite SCP you want to see on this channel? Leave us your suggestions in the comments down below. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more SCP content, then check out some of our other videos right here. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye-bye.